Aha, not today, Helen. Oh yes, definitely record it. Uh, yes, I know it's being recorded. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to assume someone's going to shout at me if they can't currently see my screen. So uh, just to brilliant, thank you for the thumbs up. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping. This is quite a fast paced talk. I also talk quickly. Uh, so it's going to be um, it's going to be very fast paced. I'm going to be one off to the other. It is being recorded. I am going to be talking through a bunch of resources. You don't need to write them down. I'm going to give you a QR code and the link at the end. So please don't worry about writing them down. Don't you don't need to spend your brain power doing that. Um, lovely to see some of you on camera. That makes a huge difference to me, especially presenting virtually because I can get to go, hi, oh, people, hello. Uh, because this is like 18 months of pandemic. I don't see anyone anymore. Um, so thank you for doing that. And thank you for taking your evening as well. I'm hoping to wrap up sort of 10 to 8 uh, time for questions. I know those of you in the UK might want to watch The Great British Bake Off. So I'm going to try and get you there for that. So uh, welcome to my talk. Writing code is easy. Being a great developer is hard. So uh, I am currently a Java developer advocate at JetBrains and I graduated some 20 years ago, giving away my age, with a very stereotypical computer science degree. We did Java even in 1997 and then it was Java 1.0. I left university. I went into the, the obvious job, a Java programmer, and I failed and I failed really badly. I failed so badly, I quit my job. I went home to my mom. She didn't want me back, love her dearly, but fair enough. I left the country, <laughs> I went to teach English abroad and I was convinced that I was an utter failure. And I, I came back and I picked myself up and I carved out a career in technical writing. And then more recently, I've come full circle and jumped back into or back into development from the point of view of a developer advocate because I realized I love creating content and Java's okay actually maybe I can do it maybe something's different and things are easier this time around so what happened what contributed to my failure back then probably drank too much probably didn't apply myself but my hypothesis is that learning code is easier than some of the other stuff that we have to learn. So little bit of background. Where do we learn? We learn predominantly at university, um, quite academic, quite theoretical, spread over three to four years. We might learn at a boot camp. So that's a, a mix of theory and a practical approach. And that is spread over one to three months. We might be self-taught. And if you're on the call and you're self-taught, my hat that I don't have, but if I did have, would come off to you because huge, huge kudos. That's so hard and wow, kind of blows my mind to be obvious, uh, to be honest with you, it's, it's amazing. Um, that's arguably the most practical approach to go into coding. Uh, there's also apprenticeship. I've heard of a few of those, especially in the UK. So that's a quite up and coming path. And they have advantages and they have disadvantages, but what do you learn? on each of these routes? Well, this is what I learned at university. This is my university. This is uh, the, the syllabus for the three stroke four years if you work in industry. And this is the 2021 intake and it's not changed. And I'm not bashing my university in any way when I say this, but I want to point out that it's not changed. It is predominantly programming data structures and algorithms, machine learning, computation, technical writing, one module, first semester. Um, but it hasn't changed. It's very theoretical in its approach. And I thought, well, OK, maybe that's just my university. So what about your university? Um, OK, similar. There are a few other topics coming up. Computers, music, data science and robotics. That sounds fun. But fundamentally, they all teach you to write code. It's all centered around this programming thing. So I thought, well, what about boot camp? And then I started to see something quite interesting coming in. It obviously there was still a huge emphasis on programming, but I started to see the more practical things, modeling and building relational databases, using the command line interface, um, managing Git and GitHub, 
oh my life, we're going to talk about that a little bit. I started to see this more practical um, topics coming in. So then I thought, okay, well, self-taught, that's the final one that we looked at. This one is really hard because I don't know what this path looks like because it wasn't my path. So I took a, a guess based on some of the courses that I found online, of course, centered around programming, but that really interesting things started to come out. Thinking like a developer. Who knew that was a thing? We're going to talk about that as well. How to use your IDE. Life balance. Time management. We all need some of that in our life. Well, I do anyway. So that's where we learned and what we learned. And it's this, right? We learned to write code, whether it's Java code or, or uh, JavaScript front end, whatever. We all learned to write code. And then we, we leave that institution if we went through a boot camp or university anyway. And then we go into a real job and that's when it gets weird. And it's really worth remembering from this point on that we are all self-taught. Once we've left that structured environment, we go into our first job, we're all self-taught. And what I, want to, what I want to do in this presentation is hopefully draw your attention to a lot of that because I want to talk about the hard. I want to talk about the self-taught skills. So these are the ones that I've learned in the last 20 years. I did not have them back in year 2000. And, Many of them I'm still definitely on the journey to. I'm going to talk about for each skill what it is, why it matters, and give you some resources of where you can learn more. Like I said at the start, there will be a QR code and the link at the end. You do not need to write them all down if you, unless you want to. Uh, they are relevant to you irrespective of your experience. So I'm going to start with the stuff that you're more likely to encounter earlier in your career and then progress through certainly I don't know there's no such thing as a stereotypical development career but progress through to some of the harder skills now if you're on the call and you've been uh, coding for a while you're probably going to recognize many of them and I really hope that you take the opportunity to recognize them as the independent self-taught skills that they are and you in turn you can help somebody else who is fresh into the career you can put some training in place for them you can not laugh at them when they screw up git if you're relatively junior in your career or you're still in the learning phase some of these may be new to you and that's okay too it's better to know what's in store and it's also to recognize that your learning journey is only just beginning so you can consider this kind of a, a whirlwind tour of the skills you're going to acquire in your path to greatness so I'm going to get started on the skills now. Right. First, I'm going to learn to use slides. First one, Googling or professional plagiarism, as I call it. And this one is so weird. You go to university and you are taught that all your solutions must be elegant and unique and you must reinvent all wheels and you must not plagiarize. That gets you thrown off the course. And then you go into your first real job and people look at you weirdly if you don't use Google. And you not just need to use Google, you need to be good at using Google. And if you're not sure whether or not you're good at using Google, ask a non-tech savvy member of your family to find the opening times for a restaurant and you'll realize you're good. It's about knowing how to optimize your search, it's knowing how to parse the results. And it also comes down to how well you can think like everybody else. Because if you're Googling something, and you're not getting any hits, you're not Googling the right thing. So it comes down to how well you can relate to other people. So this is the first resource. So this is the pattern this presentation will follow. It's going to be a, a, a skill and there's some resources. So this one is a blog from Joshua Hardwick and they keep this blog up to date, you know, with it every few months, which is really cool. And you might think a Google skill such as being able to find a page containing two words within a certain distance of each other is not that useful. But when you are down a development rabbit hole and you do not know which Stack Overflow answer to click, things being able to use Google like this is really, really useful. It's not just typing the search criteria in and hitting enter. So next skill, reading code. This one also blows my mind. 
we are taught to write code. You're not taught how to read it. And you are taught to write greenfield code. And this isn't reality. We go into our, our first job and we have, I have no props today. We have a roll of sticky tape and prayers. And we have to apply that sticky tape. And we, in order to do that, we have to understand what's already there. You have to understand what code is there and how to, to edit it and to change it. Now, there's a bunch of stuff that can help here, indentation, design patterns, your IDE, but it's about recognizing that code does not tell a story. There's no start, middle and end. Code is way more complicated than that, unless it's Hello World that, that maybe has a start, middle and end. Lots of cool resources for you on this one. First one's from my colleague, Trisha G. Uh, she has, I meant to update that link. She has lots of information on her website. And she also makes the interesting observation that it's funny that computer language is the only language where one learns to write before learning to read. Now, there's probably some of you on the call who are learning a second, third, or wow, even a fourth language. And many of you might be using something like Duolingo. And when you're, Duolingo is teaching you stuff, it teaches you how to read before it teaches you how to write. And then when you get to that lesson that's worth double XP and it's like, haha, you have to write now, it's really hard. So again, it's, it's about being able to read the code as well as write it. Second resource on this one from ANM Basler. And they write about how you can improve your code reading skills with helpful strategies. So again, when you're new into your job and you're looking at a code base and it's really scary, how you can actually change and develop that and some really helpful strategies. The observation that to be able to write good code, you have to read good code. And again, you, haven't, you won't have read a lot of good code until you are probably quite senior in your career in a lot of, um, a lot of places. You've probably read a lot of bad code, but Next skill. So my background is Java. I know you're not um, you're not all Java people. Maybe there are some Java people on the call, but the point around this skill is it's a very fast paced environment. Technology moves insanely quickly, and no matter what technology you're working in, I expect you're nodding your head right now because that's just the environment that we work in. Uh, it could well fall into your remit to put together a business case for why the business should upgrade or not. And again, for Java, it's not going to be enough to say performance and security. You need to know what that looks like. And this is another skill that we're not necessarily taught. We're not always taught to ask why. And then at some point you get through your career and go, ah, oh, I realized I've been doing that, but I didn't even realize that I was. So again, it is a different skill. It is an independent skill that you have acquired. Uh, these resources are Java specific, but um, another one from my colleague, Dalia Rabashisha, she is an expert in this field. So if you are a Java programmer and you're going, oh, Java 17, next long-term support release, have a look at the content from Dalia on her website there. Likewise, uh, Angie Jones has also covered this topic extensively if you are upgrading from Java 8. It is not just for test automation engineers either. There's loads of great takeaways and loads of uh, very interesting and helpful examples. Angie is a master at uh, using examples that we can all identify with, and many of them are food-based, which I'm a big fan of. OK, next skill. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's at least a couple of people on the call who have gone to a technical interview and been asked to do some task that in no way relates to the actual job that they were subsequently employed or not employed to do. And this is fairly common in our industry. At some point, you will probably be asked to do a technical interview. And you might be asked to do something that's a little bit unusual, or you might be asked to implement an algorithm that you would never do in your day-to-day -day coding, coding life. However, there is, all, or there is lots of help at hand. And regardless of what you, what you think about technical interviews, whether they're useful or not, it's useful to have the skills to get through them. 
because at some point you're probably going to find yourself uh, in that situation. Uh, I'm going to call on Trisha Jay again for this one because she makes some really interesting points that I think a lot of us come up against as we move through our career. Points like, how do we remain a programmer? How do we avoid getting promoted away from the technology and the code, which is what we love? So how do we, how do we move on from that? Um, she also talks about the social skills that you need to be a good developer. And I think that's really important. I'm going to talk about some of those in a bit. Um, what other skills do you need that aren't necessarily technical? Because again, the, the university, the boot camp, um, the, not so much the self-taught, but definitely the university and the boot camp, they focus so heavily on being isolated and learning to code for the most part that perhaps some of those other skills aren't necessarily there from the get-go. Uh, if technical interviews scare you, then uh, Emma Bostian has also got a book called Decoding the Technical Interview Process and a video to help you. So again, that's really interesting because these are people that have been through the process, they understand the process and they've created some cool content to help with it. Okay, oh, Angie Jones as well. Gosh, I have three resources for this one. Uh, so Angie Jones, again, lots of articles. Uh, these ones for automation engineers. So if you are interested in that stuff, definitely check her content out because it is really very, very good. If you're on the call and you are, you're perhaps in charge of technical interviews or you are, you're aware they're not working at your company and by not working, I mean, the company's not winning and the candidates aren't winning because sometimes that that can be a, a sign that they're not working have a read of this blog again it will be in the qr code at the end but sarah blogged about how they recognized that their technical interview process wasn't working and they changed it they just threw it out and they said it's not working i'm going to change it i'm going to make it better and it's a really interesting read so if you've got power over the technical interview process and you think it might need uh, overhauling, definitely have a read of that blog. Okay, next one. I know there are more IDEs than that. But at some point, you have to choose your tools. You have to start making decisions. And this is, again, a little bit further on in the presentation, because perhaps when you first start out, you'll use whatever IDE your team are using. You'll use whatever libraries and frameworks appear first in the Google search. But you have to start making the decisions and managing your dependencies. And net new code is pretty rare, as it turns out. Modifying existing code is far more common. And we have to rely extensively on third party libraries and frameworks. And they need management. And again, this is, this is a complete flip from certainly the university model, where we are given everything and told what to use. And then all of a sudden, we're into the world. and you, you get questions like, what tools would you like to use? What library should we use here? And it's not as easy as it first appears. There's a great blog from this one from Kyla Matthews. And some of this stuff is really obvious, I think, but it's only obvious because I've read it. So they come up with some really interesting points to help you to choose the right, the right technology, the right library. Do you even like the API? What are your needs? Do you understand them? How popular is it? Um, what's the testing status? So it's, it's all about asking yourselves these questions, which again, is something that is quite foreign to us when we first start out and we go into, we go into our first few jobs. Okay, next skill, being a team player. Uh, so your team are like your family, you do not get to choose them. Uh, and you're not the lone wolf that you were at university either. Remember, you get thrown off the course for plagiarism at university and somebody else doing your work. And then you go into the, your first job and you are expected to be a team player. And it's really hard. It's really hard. And I'm the first to admit it. It's I've worked very hard to make sure that I am the best version of myself and there are days I'm most definitely not the best version of myself, but you have to factor in your teammates, you have to work alongside them and that takes effort. 
there is of course the saying go somewhere quickly go it alone go far go as a team it's about it's about communication at the end of the day a couple of resources for this one a first one from offer vugman and they talk about how technical skills are only part of the story and how teamwork really matters so they came up with four things to um help you to be a better team player so you can leave your ego at the threshold uh, you can embrace feedback i do want to caveat that one unless it's toxic feedback in which case block it you can be accountable and don't be a knowledge hoarder because all that happens is people come and pester you more because the knowledge isn't anywhere else so that's a very interesting read there's also uh, this blog from Alison Denisco Ray, and it's 10 ways to become a better developer. And I, the list includes things like creating an environment of psychological safety, encouraging everyone to participate equally, uh, amplifying unheard voices in the meetings, repeat what they say, give constructive, actionable feedback, and don't criticize. Don't criticize people anyway. Hold yourself and other people accountable. Um, the one I, I definitely really, well, I like this whole list, but maintaining a growth mindset. Now, if you've not heard of a growth mindset before, there is a lady called um, da, 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 Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck. Uh, now, she um, has kind of pioneered this notion of the growth mindset. And if you're not sure what it is, consider the following sentence. I can't code versus I can't code yet. And then when you stop worrying about what other people think about you and your coding skills or your lack of coding skills, and you, you funnel that effort into coding because you can't code yet, magical things happen in your mind. So um, growth mindset, Carol Dweck, because it's not on these slides. So have a read of that, some great ideas for 10 ways to become a better developer. Okay, next skill that you need, you have to be able to solve problems. And this comes with a certain mindset and it doesn't always come naturally. Um, it's kind of two approaches. We, we often, we always, we always have to keep things simple, especially to start with, because development is hard and complexity layers up quickly. And then there's the second aspect of, it doesn't work, not really sure why, or the even weirder one, it works, not really sure why. And we've probably all found ourselves in one or other of those camps uh, pretty much daily as it can be when you're when you're at the coal face. So it's about being a problem solver. Uh, Steve Jobs had a very interesting thing to say on this because he came out with the quote that everyone in the country should learn to program a computer because it teaches you to think. I'm not sure I'm completely in agreement with that sentence, but I do think it's an interesting point to raise because I do think there is a specific mindset that goes alongside being a developer. It's about mirroring your thought process and problem solving. So talking of problem solving, the resource here, this is from um, Richard Reese, and in their blog, they came up with a, a four prong approach for how to solve a problem. So here's what human beings do when we're stuck. Number one, we try a solution. Number two, if it doesn't work, we try a solution. Number three, if it doesn't work, we try a solution. And for those of you in security, effectively, we try and brute force it. We just keep hammering the door, trying something else, because that's how we operate. That's a very human thing to do. We just keep trying until the door falls down. And it's not very effective and it's incredibly frustrating. So what Richard said was, okay, break it into a framework. First, understand what's being asked. So really understand it. The number of times that we just don't understand stuff is quite, um, quite baffling. Number two, plan. Don't just dive straight in there. Plan how you're going to solve the problem. Because if you don't plan, 
before you know it, you've forgotten to create a Git branch, you've forgotten the steps you took to get to this point and you're lost. Number three, divide the problem up. So you've all heard the saying divide and conquer. And this is again, how we can solve problems instead of this brute force. And then number four, if that didn't work and you're stuck, you can debug it, you can reassess it, you can do more research. You can, it's like a depth first approach versus um, breadth first. You can actually go down, go, okay, that didn't work. Come back to the top of the tree, go down and try that. And it's a much more planned approach to a really buggy problem. So I really like that framework. Okay, time for an annoying GIF. This is the only one in the presentation and I'm gonna pause it now. Uh, so writing tests, I didn't write a single test at university. I didn't write a single test. It was a long time ago. I hope things have changed, but um, maybe they have, maybe they haven't. But regardless of what you think of test-driven development or if you practice it, we are not always taught to write tests and writing tests is a unique skill set. It is different to writing code. Yes, it is writing code, but it's especially with test-driven development, being able to switch your brain over to that approach is not simple. So there's plenty, certainly in the Java world, there's lots of testing frameworks to help with this, but it's about understanding the value that tests can bring you. And it, that's just irrespective of test-driven development. It's about having the confidence in your code and testing goes a really long way to achieving that. Okay, if test-driven development is your cup of tea, um, the book by Kent Beck, highly recommend uh, it's an excellent read there's also this blog from dave cheney and they make the observation of if you don't someone will test your software someone will do it a user will do it and if you worry about who will maintain your code after you're gone write good tests especially if you know that person um, but they talk about who should perform that testing what the proportion of manual testing is what that testing means for your code and how that can give you confidence to change your code as well. Okay, next skill, working with VCS. I have put Git there because I'm going to focus on Git just from its commonality point of view. Uh, another self-own, we didn't use version control at university. So our, our idea of version control was to zip up the the code base and put it on your desktop. It was Windows 95. Um, so <laughs> things have changed an awful lot and you will frequently become fairly proficient in Git pretty quickly. You'll be able to do the branching, the cloning, the committing, a basic smush, a basic merge, but then something's gonna go wrong. And I guarantee it will go wrong you will make a small mistake and then you will compound that mistake by trying to fix the first mistake or someone will have rebased when they should have merged and your local repo is completely out of sync something will go wrong and you will have to phone the resident git expert on the team uh, now where i at my previous role uh, this was a a very ta talented gentleman called paul and in the end, he did a Git lunch and learn on all the innovative ways that I had screwed up Git. And it was really well attended. And I thought, huh, it's not just me. Git's really hard. So it's about, uh, it's about firstly recognizing that Git is hard. I mean, if you're on the call and you don't think Git's hard, just, you know, come find me afterwards so you can teach me. Um, but it's about recognizing that being able to get yourself out of trouble is really, really helpful as well. Lots of great resources for Git. Book from Katie Silo Miller called Oh Shit Git or Dang It Git. Same book, one sweary, one not. And I like this book because it goes from the problem point of I accidentally committed something to the wrong branch or I need to undo a commit from like five commits ago. And I'm, uh, that's me literally every other week because I always get carried away going, I'm going to do this, da, 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 commit, push. Um, so I really like that. There's also an excellent blog from Peter Cottle. Um, sorry, it's not a blog. It is a website 
you can actually learn the basics of Git branching. It's very visual and it's very helpful. So that's a good one as well. If you're on the call and you've heard Git and GitHub and you're not entirely sure what the difference is, um, have a read of this blog. For those of you on the call who know the difference, you might think, oh, it's really obvious, but it's not if you're new and you're new to Git. So check out um, what is Git and GitHub or Git versus GitHub because it breaks it down right from the beginning and it's really, really helpful because I've seen experienced developers get this wrong. So have a read of that if you're not sure. Okay, reviewing code. Again, this one is, is kind of crazy because we're never taught to do this at university. And can you imagine your, your lecturer saying, oh, could you just go and review the code that Katie wrote, please? See what you think. No one ever says that. Um, and it's about, read. It's, it's related to reading your code as well. So yes, code reviews can be toxic. That is a separate presentation, especially if this happens. Um, it's very easy to say your method name doesn't follow convention or why have you used that loop construct when you could use this. But experience will tell you what to focus on and what to give feedback on. So resource here, um, Angie Jones. So she created, and I love this list, she created the 10 commandments for code reviews. And it includes wonderful nuggets of knowledge, like how not to take it personally, how to detach yourself from the code, how you can contribute your rationale to the code review without you know, getting angry, how you can compromise, and of course, how treating others how you like to be treated. That's really, really important as well. So phenomenal list. If you're just starting to do code reviews, make sure you get support from your peers. They are difficult to do well, in my, uh, in my opinion. There's also um, some great resources from Dr. Michaela Grilla. So they talk about what we've all heard either or we've all experienced, some of us, that team fear, some teams fear and because they've experienced that the main drawback of code reviews is to reduce code velocity which means reduce productivity. And then if the code reviews are rubbish, nobody is winning, literally nobody is winning. So um, she talks through how you can actually change that model, try different things and hopefully make code reviews more helpful and more useful for your team. Okay, <laughs> debugging. So, uh i don't know what the equivalent is for other languages but in java we have a line of code called system.out.println brackets quotes do we even get in this loop and we use it for debugging all the time and it's not very efficient and it's not very fast and i don't know why i'm admitting to it on a recorded presentation but it's true people still do it because IDEs were not around 20 years ago, debuggers were not around, and even though they are around now, we don't know, um, we don't always make the time to learn them until we've got a problem, by which point when we've got a problem in our code that needs the debugger, we're already stressed because we have a problem in our code. So debugging is a skill, it is a huge skill. And it is a skill that takes a really, a really open mind to progress. Right, if you're on Twitter, um, please go check out Julia Evans. Uh, it, this one is in the, uh, in the QR code at the end. I am a huge fan of her work. And when I was putting this presentation to get together, it was like she knew, because this tweet appeared on my timeline of, you know, if you've run into a bug and it's, it's felt impossible, what made it feel that way? So what Julia Evans does with the, uh, the insight that she gathers from the community is creates uh, designs and graphics to help us to understand why we might be struggling with something. So in the end, she came up with these, uh, she posted that question and the output was that a bug might feel impossible because it's hard to reproduce. Uh, we might be missing something. Our mental model might be missing something. Uh, we might not have the tools to inspect the program state, but it goes back to the debugger. 
one of our assumptions might be wrong. That happens. Or the bug is just really freaking complicated. And it might be one or more of those things, but it's, it's worth remembering that debugging is really, really hard. Okay, how many of you have walked into a, a room, sat down with a team and been asked to come up with an estimate uh, for how long it's going to take? Nobody teaches you how to do that either. In fact, at university, you go, you, you do the course and then the lecturer says, oh, you have three weeks to do this assignment. And you go, okay, two weeks in the pub, half a week at home, half a week to do the assignment, got it. And then you go into your job and you have to somehow learn how to calculate in a completely different way and say upfront how long is something is going to take you. Uh, there's often business pressure to overcommit, um, and that doesn't end well. So why is estimating so hard? This blog, this blog absolutely nails it for me. So imagine the scenario. There are six to 10 people you're going on a trip. It's going to last three to five days. Everybody eats different food. You need to buy some drinks. Not too many, they're heavy. Don't forget the tea because we're British and we like tea. Get the best possible quality. Now, before you even go into the store, tell me how much that's going to cost. It's really, really difficult. <laughs> there are some things you can do. You can break down the work, you can look at history, you can ask questions, you can um, take your degree of confidence into account. For example, I always, always um, underestimate how long something will take me. It's, it's like a thing I do even, and I know I do it and I still can't stop doing it. So I, I add extra time onto my estimates because I know that that is a behavior that I have. So consider that when you're, when you're doing estimations. There's also this, uh, this is an excellent blog of <laughs> why software developers suck at estimating time and how to fix it. And this author comes up with four reasons why we're not very good at it. So Parkinson's law, that is everything will take as long as you give it. So if you say it will take a week, it, it will take a week. Uh, everyone is different. Thank goodness for that. Software development is a process. It's not just about writing the code. There's a whole ecosystem of other stuff that we have to do. And if you're not sure what that ecosystem is, just look in your calendar. And it takes time to get in the zone. Most of us don't just rock up to work, whether that's the dining room table or an office and go, right, I'm ready to code. It's hard and it's an art and it takes time. Okay, next resource, um, deleting code. And we're never taught how to do that either. We are taught to write it, put it on a pedestal and admire it. Uh, we're not taught that it shouldn't live forever or that code has a life cycle. We're, we're just, um, it just lives and we move on. But that's again, not the real world. Now, when I started looking for resources for this one, I came across a very interesting, um, interesting and a blog that could anger some people, I suppose. And it was this one, and it's from Melissa McEwen. And the author said, I'll delete your commented out code without reading it, and I'm not sorry. And I was like, whoa, don't delete my commented out code. That's not cool. But then I thought, well, that's what version control is for. So if you're deleting your code, don't comment it out because it should be in version control. Even hello world should be in version control and you can just version control it, delete it and move on. Um, the author does go on to talk about various ways that you can approach this and you can catch it before it becomes comment junk. So it is controversial, but it could be worth tracking for you. If you are still thinking I'm going to carry on commenting out code because I'm not sure if it's used or not, consider this story. Uh, it's a little bit old now, 2017 old. Um, long story short, they launched a new, um, they updated the service for the New York Stock Exchange. They did so manually. Three out of four deployments passed, one failed, left the old version running. Um, 
the old version, or sorry, the new version recycles an old flag. That was no longer used. It had been repurposed to mean something different. They switched it on. Software apocalypse. Uh, the old version of the code still had a dependency and it woke up zombie software apocalypse and it resulted in a loss of $10 million per minute until they could shut it down 45 minutes later. So please don't comment out your code. Please just delete it if you're not using it. Otherwise, bad things happen. Um, OK, next skill. Right, what have I got? Got about five left. OK, pair programming. Uh, so pair programming is really, really helpful no matter what the technology is. Two heads is definitely better than one most of the time. It is, I say most of the time because it is mentally exhausting and incredibly rewarding. So find opportunities that allow you to pair program, turn up, give it your best shot. I do want to caveat this with there are some days when, you know, if my colleagues were to say to me, what does your best day look like, Helen? I'd be like, not here. <laughs> not here. I don't want to be here today. Um, so be aware of your own your own mental health and where you're at, especially in terms of you're going to be pairing with somebody for an extended period of time. A couple of resources here uh, for you. First one from Sam Fair talks about mob programming. So if you're interested in what that is and how that works, you can check that one out. There's also a blog from Nat Bennett uh, that I've linked, which is about more on the, the burnout side of things, uh, where they talk about how he pair programmed for most days for years with hundreds of other engineers and makes the observation that it was one of the best things uh, I've ever done for myself, socially and emotionally, and it produced some great software, but it also burnt me out. So that's something to, that's quite an interesting read because it looks at it from both angles as well. Uh, if you are not familiar with pair and mob programming and you don't know what they are, check out this guest post uh, from Brigitte Bockler and Nina Sasega on Martin Fowler's blogs, because they talk about how to do it, the benefits and the challenges. Red Green Refactor talks it, um, it will step you through it really, really nicely. So have a read of that one if you're not sure or you think you might want to try them out. Okay, next skill, managing your meeting load. <sighs> wow, we've all been there, haven't we? We just look at our calendar and die slightly inside. Um, we have developers have a lot of meetings as a rule and if you don't have a lot of meetings that's great but remember that they come with a heavy contexting switching cost back when we're learning it's very asynchronous it's very just this and then this and then this that is not the real world we have to learn to use our time wisely group meetings and check in with ourselves as well so this matrix is going to be familiar to most of you, I, I expect, the Eisenhower matrix. If it's urgent and important, just do it. If it's urgent but not important, can somebody else do it? If it's not urgent but it is important, plan it. And if it's not urgent or important, what is it even doing on your plate? And it's worth going through this every now and again with your workload, especially if you're feeling overwhelmed. You might be surprised at what you can get rid of. Also a great blog from Dan Lines on too many meetings. Um, when he spoke to software engineers, he actually discovered that it wasn't that we hated meetings, we hated ineffect, ineff ugh, inefficiency, poorly planned meetings, poorly executed meetings, missing deadlines or not getting enough time to do our coding. So that's what we really, really don't like. So there's lots of tips in that blog for how to actually um, get some of your time back, including just looking at your calendar and going, how many hours a week do I spend in meetings? Because that statistic might surprise you. And then you should take that into account when you're doing your estimations as well. OK, next skill, switching contexts. Uh, so this can be planned. Uh, like estimates, um, changing tasks halfway through the sprint, or it can be unplanned like curveballs in life and you will get them. You will get that phone call that nobody ever wants to get. Uh, you will always have those moments where you have to drop work and go. And there is a cost bit that you have to factor in. Switching context is really difficult. There's also something called attention residue, which Mayumi Nishimoto talks about in their blog here. 
and it's about attention residue is where you have a meeting at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock. And then at two o'clock, you realize you're still thinking about the meeting that finished at 10 o'clock. And this can have a really serious knock on effect for your engagement and your satisfaction. And it leaves you exhausted as well. It's not, it's not healthy for you. Talking of exhausted, please learn this word. Please, please, please learn this word. I know you don't want to annoy the boss or let anybody down, but burnout is real. You have to set boundaries and you have to set your priorities. And I can't do a presentation without a grumpy cat. Some great blogs here. Um, first one from Hussein Pollock to Yurik. And this blew my mind when I first read it because they said, perhaps you can say no to writing that code. And I was like, developers don't say no to writing code. What, what, what is that about? But then they make the observation that your code has to be read and understood has to be tested and debugged. It's going to increase defects in your software. It's going to increase bugs. And I was like, huh, you're calling my code buggy? But of course code is buggy. That's the nature of code. So interesting idea. Maybe you can say no. There's also this one from the developer workload. So if you are not comfortable saying no and it, it, it weirds you out, have a read of this because it can be a really practical approach, how you can examine your caseload, how you can say no, how you can be respectful and honest and potentially offer up an alternative as well. Okay, um, we are coming towards the end. So being aware of your mental health. Uh, I've already mentioned it's a very fast moving industry. Any job can take a detrimental toll on your mental health. It is the importance of mindfulness, of rest, and having those around you, especially now. You know, I'm not going to, the last 18 months, <laughs> it's really, really important. Um, many of us have learned the hard way by burning out. Uh, it's, it's not where anybody wants to be. I also want to point out that you don't need a side project or a hustle to be a great developer. You do not need to code on your weekends. If you want to, great, but you do not need to. Some great blogs here. First one from Lena Kozar and Vova Vok. They talk about how or four things you can do to improve your mental health. So the difference between that focused 40 minutes and unfocused. You know, we all think we're not working if we're taking a shower, but your brain is working. How many good ideas have you had in the shower? Uh, don't forget to work out. Teamwork is everything. Um, uh, get oxytocin. Um, hormone uh, rate in childbirth, not just childbirth, really does do wonders for your mental health. Uh, so have a read of that because there's some really helpful tips in there. There's also these articles from um, Brian Robinson and they really drove the point home for me. I, I'm pretty sure this wasn't just within the IT, but I expect the figures are even higher in IT. 48% uh, have experienced burnout, 61% elevated stress, 32% have felt lonely. Those are crazy, crazy figures. So the couple of blogs here. Um, the second one I do want to draw your attention to, especially if you are working for a company that is talking about a hybrid approach, going back to the office kind of part time, and you're not quite sure where their loyalties lie. The second blog, 10 red flags that psychological safety is lacking in your workplace have a read of that because if you're if you're not quite sure if your company is fully invested in remote working for the long term you might um, you might have some helpful information that you could take from that right having a great work life balance um, i don't need to say much about this one other than it is insanely important the most important family friends hobbies they are all much much needed blog here from Anu Padier. Uh, they talk about prioritizing your time, following a strict routine, which I'm terrible at, cut out the things which are not important, be aware of burnout, don't be a perfectionist, it is the enemy of getting anything done, learn to say no, and enjoy yourself, because if you don't enjoy yourself, what's the point? Um, the next one from, this is an article from Karina, and uh, this is about balancing work life as a developer. There is a link in that blog to a TED video, which I'm not going to ruin it for you because I think you should go watch it. 
but it's about work-life balance and it's about how the gentleman pictured in the video there made one small, small change to his daily schedule after a phone call from his wife and the impact that that had on, um, on his kid. It really is, uh, I'm not crying, you're crying moment. So have a look at that. So to summarize, writing code is the easy part. Writing code, learning to write code is not easy, but it is the easy part. Being a great developer is hard. It's not just about writing code, it's all the other stuff that you learn on the job. So what do you do now? Well, this is your call to action slide that the QR code is coming, the link I will paste so you don't need to scan the QR code. But this is the part where I really want you to give yourself a huge pat on the back for being generally rather awesome. <laughs> Just realize how far you've come, realize how many of these skills you've learned. And this is also the part where you go and you help somebody else who is new to the industry. They might not have these skills, I didn't. They might not even know that they need them. I didn't. And you can show them the way. So that is the QR code. I'm going to leave that on screen for a mo, but I will also paste the link into the chat as well. And I am definitely out of time. That was very fast. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing that and then Wow, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. It was very fast. That to go. <laughs> uh, let, me, yeah. let me paste that link. I in. have a new Go job on. right now. And uh, wow, I mean, right now I like a kitchen, kitchen in uh, trying to swim and everything is new. And uh, yeah, I, I understand a lot of things here. So thank you. Thank you. Do we it's, have um, um, more questions to him? I'm just Scott, I didn't read the chat as I was going along. Apologies. Scrolling back through the chat. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the link I've put in the chat, that contains all the resources. Uh, if you do find any errors or Could broken links. QR code. Do you let me know, sorry. Yeah. I missed that. Yeah, we have. Uh, Kathleen, you have a question, I see. Oh. Hi, yeah. Hey, Helen, thank you so much for the Hello. amazing talk. Um, I'd love to know if um, any of these tips you suggested are specifically aimed at women who code or if there's any like other tips that you suggest to overcome these like specific barriers that we have in the workplace of feeling maybe mm -hmm. like personally like feeling like equal or feeling supported. That's a great question. Uh, so the the presentation originally was um, not not focused specifically um, at women or for women in the workplace. It was more focused on just general development. I think in terms, what would I say for, for women specifically? Um, I think I would just say, be strong, know your worth, know that you're good and just as good as the next person um, and try Try to make sure that you are not trying to make sure, make sure you are in an environment where you can thrive. There was definitely an element of that, that I wasn't in that environment. And some of that was definitely naivety on my part. Um, so I know I would do things differently if I had my time over and I'd be a lot less harsh on myself. But it's only in my, um, my more recent years that I've kind of come back to it and gone, oh, okay. Well, yeah, coding's really difficult. And of course, my university shouldn't have taught this stuff. I'm not saying the university should teach that stuff, but it's about recognizing that I can do it. And it's about who you surround yourself with. Surround yourself with people who are going to lift you up. Surround yourself with people who are going to champion you. Surround yourself with people who believe in you. Um, that's probably a whole other talk in terms of workplaces that potentially aren't that. Um, but yes, that's what I would say. 
Thank you. Choose your friends and your colleagues carefully. I think I have a question about fair programming. Uh, we don't have it as a tradition on my job right now. So do you have any advice or tips how to start introduce this technique if uh, uh, the team that didn't do it? Yes, uh, I love pair programming. Uh, I, would, I would say it's as simple as, can we try a little bit of pair programming and just you know pick a colleague that you think is go you're going to learn from and hopefully will be amenable to it. Um, start small, so just be like an hour. Another advantage of pair programming is if you're using the same tools, you're using the same IDE, you can see uh, everybody's shortcuts, like keyboard shortcuts, which is super helpful. Uh, I'm biased, obviously working for JetBrains, but um, it's just, just ask, just start small. But then I would also say, be aware of yourself because I don't know about, you know, people on the call, but I'm not, I'm not the best version of myself for 30 days every month. Some days I'm just like, I'm tired. I've had a phone call that's thrown me off. I'm not feeling very well. So be aware of what's going on with you, because if you're going to put yourself in close, maybe not close physical proximity, given the pandemic, but certainly close mental proximity with another person, then that's, that's stressful. So make sure you're in the right place for that. Um, but just, just ask, just, just try, just get started. And you can pair on anything, by the way, it doesn't need to be code. You can pair on writing documentation. You can pair on writing tests. You can pair on debugging. Debugging is a great one to pair on because we all go at things from a specific mindset and we don't always it's very difficult to kind of bring ourselves up to a level of going, okay, well, wh what, what could this bug be? It goes back to how to debug. We all approach problems differently. Well, thank you. I didn't think in this way even. <laughs> Good luck yeah. with it. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Somebody's asking for link again, so let me just share that. That's the QR code. That link I've put in, the QR code goes to the same place. So either or. Welcome. I don't think I've ever given that talk that quickly. We have a lot of um, gratitude there. Thank you. If anybody does have any questions and they think of them afterwards or your question hasn't fully formed, um, you can drop me a note on Twitter or LinkedIn, preferably Twitter. I'm more there than anywhere. Uh, my DMs are open, so I'd love to hear from you. And yeah, thank you again for um, giving me some of your time this evening. It is much appreciated or evening for me, wherever in the world you are. Thank you so much. Hey, I think we can end this meeting. So I